The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. Greater Salem, New Hampshire Chamber of Commerce presents Success in the 603, a podcast focusing on Granite Staters who have had success in the public or private sector. We'll hear stories of how these people came to be, where they are, and what you can do to get there too. Sit back and enjoy. You are in wicked awesome company. Well, welcome back, everyone. My name is Donna Morris, and welcome to the Success in the 603, a podcast where we have, um, as our guests, successful Granite Staters that are going to share their secrets with you about how they got to where they are, what their influencers are, and just tell their story to you. Um, I serve as the president of the Greater Salem Chamber of Commerce. This show is part of the chamber, and my sidekick. I'm Craig Dufton. I'm with Keller Williams Realty. I'm also a small business owner and proud chamber member. Yes. We have a great guest here today. Um, we have Mike Moore and is in the house with us, as we say here in the in the, in the, in the empty house. Unfortunately, today we I'm just kidding. No, we have a really audience. huge studio audience. If you want to come down, there's plenty of space left for you. So um, today we have a great guest. He's a, a 43 year radio and TV personality, Mike Moore, and um, started in Detroit. Actually, he was born in Detroit. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, Toledo, Washington D.C., New York City, Boston, New Hampshire. And he retired after 20, 20 years with a radio station here right in uh, Manchester, WZID. In 2014, you've been retired for four years now, huh? Almost five, buddy. Wow. Oh. Mm -hmm. As a columnist for the Nashua Telegraph since 2004, Mike served as vice president of National Society of Newspaper Columnists. They gave him the great uh, Will Rogers Humanitarian Award in 2013. He's also a regular, regular contributor to New Hampshire Magazine. Mike is devoting his retirement to writing books, which we're going to talk about his books today. And his first book was Fifty Shades of Radio, True Stories of a Morning Guy Being Wired, Tired, and Fired. <laughs> the best. His second book just released today, as a matter of fact, right? That's right. Is, uh, is Lunch with Tommy and Stasia, <laughs> TV's Golden Age of Candlepin Bowling. Now, I'm in the perfect age of loving that, sitting by the fire. Fire's there, TV's on, watching Candlepin Bowling on Saturday. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Mike, thank you for being here. It's my it's pleasure. It's a pleasure, to, pleasure right. to have you. Thank you for having me. I love the studio here. It is a great Two studio. Two guys have come up with a brilliant concept as another whole aspect of their business. So this is really impressive. It is. If you haven't been here, it, you, you really should stop by. Saturday, Saturday, the Cigar Authority is on. They've got a great crowd, 12 to 2. So basically, it's called Studio 21 Cafe. And it's, a, as they mentioned, at the top of uh, Two Guys Smoke Shop on South Broadway in Salem. <clears throat> proud chamber member he is yeah. as well, too, Dave Garofalo. <laughs> and if you have an idea for a podcast, you can come down and see Dave and pitch it to him and book your time and start getting your message out there. And that's, you know, we're going to talk a, lot, a little bit about the history of media and, and this is it, too. Yeah, this is where we're headed, right? <laughs> so. Everybody can just do it on demand now. So, Mike, let's start in the Motor City where you, where you were born. Sure. Talk about talk about your your early years. Mike Moore in early years. Let's yeah, yeah, Mike Moore in the uh, the the prequel, yes. as, as it were. <laughs> yeah, born in Detroit uh, in Henry Ford Hospital, which is right downtown, actually near the headquarters of Motown Records on West Grand Boulevard. Nice. And I uh, went, to, went to school and uh, found my love of radio when my family moved from one town to another where I had to be driven as opposed to taking a bus in the fifth grade. And as I was in the car for 15 minutes uh, every morning, starting in the fifth grade, I was listening to morning radio. Back when morning radio was really at its heyday, it's not as corporate as it is today. Sure. And, and I just thought, oh, my God, this is so much fun. Imagine doing this. Uh, as a job. And so I just got totally enraptured by it, uh, majored in college, University of Detroit, and uh, got my degree in communications. And immediately as a sophomore, while I was still in school, got my first radio job because I didn't want to wait and compete with everybody when they got their degrees. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get the head start. Sure. And it uh, worked out for me. My first job was in northern Michigan, in 1971, where I was paid $1.60 an hour. Nice. So I would drive two hours, no, four hours each way. So I'd spend eight hours on the road, work eight hours, make uh, 64, no, not even that, whatever it was, for eight hours and uh, at a buck sixty an hour. $76 a week? So it, not even that. Yeah. And, uh, and it turned out to be what I fell in love with and continue to do until, as you pointed out, I retired almost five years ago. Wow. I said, you know what? I love this, but I need to take these skill sets and find some other things to do 
before part of my brain rots away, and then it's too late to do anything because I, I don't like the beach and I don't play golf, so I need to do something creative. So here we are. Yeah, nice. So when you, you mentioned that uh, it was back in its heyday, mm-hmm. um, so how has it, what, what was that? It, was it more of the um, less music, more talk? Like how, what, what have you seen from when the year that you started to the year that you left? When you're talking morning radio. Morning radio has its own flavor. It Can you does. Talk about that? Morning radio, because you have such a, a transient audience uh, and people aren't at work yet, so you can kind of still grab their ear. But once people get to work, it's more music and less talk. Uh, how has it changed over the years? Uh, it was a lot more creative and inventive back in the early 60s. Remember, it was just coming out of a time when radio had it all. Television really jumped in in the early 70s, and a lot of people who were famous radio stars tried television. Some succeeded, like Milton Berle and Bob Hope and people like that, Lucille Ball, but others didn't do so well. So it, it, it created a whole new culture of, of just regular people finding out that they could tap into the community and have some fun, do some skits, now, uh, radio has become very corporate. There are some like uh, iHeartRadio and, and groups like that that have a thousand stations, and it's, it's the lawyers that are running it. They won't let anybody have any fun anymore. Right. And, you know, I've done some stunts in the past that if I were still in radio now, I never would have pulled them off. Mm. So uh, it really has become... Dare we talk Bottom about line. those? We can, we, we're in a podcast. We can talk about whatever That's we want. We can. So. Yeah, most of them are, are, are PG rated, but some of them actually got me some national publicity. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. All right. Well, give us one. All right. The, probably the one I'm best known for happened in 2000. I was at WHOB in Nashua, which is now Frank FM, and uh, it was the summer of 2000. The tall ships were visiting. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> this is good for the audience. Though. The, the tall, sh- <laughs> the tall ships were visiting uh, the USS Constitution there in Charlestown Harbor. And it seemed like every night when I put on the news on TV, that was the lead story. Yeah. And I said, I'm getting pretty tired of this. Yeah, I know it's a great thing, but it, it's just boring me to death. So I decided I would announce uh, one morning that uh, one of the tall ships had left Charlestown went up through the North Shore into Newburyport, up the Merrimack River to dock at the Songus Arena in Lowell. Nice. Now, now think about how that could never happen, except people unless, hear what they unless want. Unless it was airlifted in well, and, dropped, yeah. and dropped down. There's like 15 it. bridges. There's rapids. The, the water isn't very deep, so the, the draft of the I boat is there's a dam in Lawrence, too, yeah. that you got to get by. But, yeah, there's a lot of dams in Lawrence, <laughs> but that's a whole different story. So uh, I announced this, and, and before I went on the air, I had one listener call in, and I said, you want to help me? We're going to pull a prank here. I want you to go along with the fact that that the tall ships are at the Songus Arena in Lowell, and you were there yesterday, and describe what you saw. And she did it beautifully. So it legitimized. It wasn't just Mike making You're that like joke. a modern-day Orson Welles. Every sort time, of. Right? Sort of, yeah. <laughs> Although 200 pounds more than me, but that's another story. So it was great. People went along with it because here's why. People would rather drive someplace close than go to Boston. So they heard what they wanted to hear. Right. And uh, so one lady from Hudson, New Hampshire, drove down. Found out that she'd been had, was very upset, called the station, called the Nashua Telegraph to complain. And the Nashua Telegraph called me at home and said, uh, what's this all about? And, and I said, ah, I just had a little bit of fun, but I was irresponsibly using the airwaves. And they said, well, can you give us a statement? I said, I can't. You've got to call the general manager. So what happened is before he could call the general manager, I called the general manager and said, hey, look at the papers in, into this. Uh, tell him that I, I, you know, I'm going to get suspended or whatever, and maybe we can get some publicity. Well, that worked pretty well. Next day, the headline above the fold in the Nashua Telegraph said, uh, Tall Tail Lands DJ in Hot Water, or Tall Ship's Tail, something to that effect. And in the background of the picture of me in the studio, you could see uh, boxes of Salada tea. Because once I announced that I was being suspended, all these people showed up and dumped tea bags in the parking lot of the radio yes, station. Right. The Boston Tea Party lives again. The Nashua Tea Party. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and you know, for those known. for those who don't know the geography from <laughs> Hudson to Lowell, really not that far. It's no. not like she it's not like she yeah. drove two hours and but packed up the kids and that's and went, right. So. But she probably felt stupid right. that, that she fell for something that isn't remotely possible. But that right. goes back to the radio host. Yes. Mor- morning radio host. Yes, exactly. Culture, you know? Totally. And that's what drew me in is doing stuff like yeah, that. Having a little fun. Yeah. yeah like you got to pick your spots and you can't do it too often because right. people will say, oh, he's pulling our, our leg. He's right. yanking our chain. Well, you got to make, you got to build a yeah. better, better mousetrap too. You know, you're, mm-hmm. you're definitely, 
You know, you got to have that flavor. You got to have yes. that charisma. And yet, you had some great uh, co-hosts over the years. Oh, too, I that, sure did. That I helped sure did. you out. But I could never. Let's say ten years later, I want to do that while I'm at WZID, which is a, a very corporate station. They gave me a lot of freedom, but that's one thing that if I wanted to do that, I would have had to get submitted to the boss, yeah. and then it would have had to go to corporate, and then the lawyers would have to sign off on it, which they wouldn't, yeah. uh, because somebody might get killed. And um, so by then, by the time I get the okay back, I'm, I'm on to something else. I'm not interested anymore. Yeah. I, can, I can give you an example of something that I did at WCGY in Lawrence here in the Merrimack Valley in uh, probably about 1990 or so. I did something called the Urinary Olympics one morning, and what I <laughs> and I was inspired by a bar in Manchester that did this. Here's what they did during happy hour: oh, I, you could come in the bladder buster. I did the this bladder buster. In my youth. So you did that <laughs> in my youth, yeah, with my uh, husband. <laughs> all right, all right. We're gonna get to that next. Let me just uh, say how shocked I am to hear that. <laughs> so people would come in during happy hour, and and everybody would get free drinks until the first person got up and had to go to the bathroom. So you don't want to be really? that person that's going to ruin oh, it for everybody wow. else. So I thought, well, why don't we do that on live radio some morning with just water? You can't do booze or anything. So I had eight people sitting around the, the studio, and I, I was giving them um, water. They would each get up to a gallon of water, and we did this over the course of an hour. And by the time the, the hour went by, there was only one guy standing, and so he won the prize. Um, and that's a, a gallon is 128 ounces of water. I mean, imagine your bladder, you know, ending up about that size. <laughs> But here's the problem. Some guys did that in Oregon maybe six, seven years ago on a morning show, and somebody died. Oh, geez. And it's, yeah. it's from something called water poisoning. I don't know the uh, medical name for it. And so the station got sued. The, the DJs got well, see, sued. I wonder why the lawyers would have said no. Yeah. Well, see, and I didn't know there was such a thing as water poisoning. I Not that it would have stopped me. but uh, I don't I, think anybody knows water poisoning until the first poor bastard that gets water poisoning. And then, <laughs> there you uh, go. Unfortunately, the rest of the right. people are like, yeah, that was water poisoning and that Joe died from it. Like, so, oh, so Donna, you, you survived. Did you actually? Um, I only went a couple of times, but it was a thing because I was probably, you know, it was early 90s then. Yeah. I was in 21, 22 in downtown Manchester. Mm -hmm. It was called the Bladder Buster. I remember that. I was just starting to uh, thought, oh, date my a, husband. And I'm like, yes. wow. He must have been impressed, huh? No, well, you no, can hold your water me. better than him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> did a woman, did a woman ever win that contest? Because no, that usually was, it was a woman who would go and we'd all be yeah. like, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> now we can right. Yeah, but, we had women though in the studio that day. A couple yeah. of them, and but a guy did win it. So, so. Um, we're going to take a quick commercial break because uh, the part of the reason we can even have success in the six hundred three is that we have some sponsors. So beautiful um, sponsors like you, yeah. you out there waiting to sponsor Call us. us. <laughs> this is an awesome program, and we love your support. So Armon Networks, we had them on last week. Uh, Tim Howard. They are a. They're based in New Hampshire. And they offer customized managed IT services, cybersecurity service, and structured cabling services for small and mid-sized businesses throughout New England. They apply their expertise of their certified networking engineers and, and information technology technicians to completely address all of your IT needs. Be sure to give them a call at 603-642-4010. You can find them online at armonnetworks.com. Thank you so much for your support. Yes, thank you so much. Tim Howard was a great guy. Um, yeah. Recommend him highly. Mike, I have to ask you how 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 did you get to the six hundred three? How did you and go from ah. the Motor City and yeah. come to the six hundred three? I'm really curious. What, sure, what and and, and I do get asked that. Kept you that, here. that that's a good question. That's a really good question because radio is a very um, transient business, mostly because it's fairly insecure. Yeah. Uh, it's not as bad as it used to be because there aren't as many jobs, sadly, because of satellite radio and, and a lot of other reasons. But in, in order to really progress up the chain, you have to move because usually you don't advance within a station. I always knew I wanted to do mornings, but for about the first 10 years of my career, you know, I was doing middays or afternoons. And I said, I know I've got more that I'd like to do. And you, you can't do much messing, messing around once the workday starts because people can't pay attention to their jobs and pay attention to tall ships gags. Yeah. So I ended up going to work for, uh, for uh, well, to, to begin, in college, I worked in Detroit, which is pretty good because that's a, the top, at the time a top five market, but it was part-time, low-level employment. Then I went to Toledo, Ohio for eight years, 
where I, you know, got kind of established, but not doing mornings, which I wanted to do. But I was a TV weatherman for a year, and that was fun, and started a a humor service for radio personalities that 150 radio stations subscribe to. So that was kind of cool. Before the internet, you would send them once a month, you'd send them eight pages and say, okay, make it last. You know, there's some good ideas in here, so don't use it all on the first show. So from there, I went to the nation's first all-comedy radio station, WJOK in Washington, D.C. They put, they put an ad out. They were looking for, you know, five or six DJs. 350 people applied. They picked five, and I was lucky enough to, to be one of them. That was 1983. Okay. And it was in suburban Washington, and, and it was great because when you think of how funny things are in Washington, mm-hmm. that was right there. And, and even more amazing being in the backyard of the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, where they have very strict rules about language, our station got permission to run unexpurgated comedy at night from 10 until 4 in the morning. Really? Oh, so wow. the seven dirty words from George Carlin or whatever, we could, we could air. That yeah, was, maybe you that don't want to be a morning person. You yeah. want to be a night guy right. down there. All right. So I did afternoons at that, at that station. Would you say that that was your, your, your moment, like you, where you... you um, knew that you made it or that I, you know what I mean I, that's a pretty Craig you know, I think you're right about that of, five out of 350 yeah brother, that's yeah good. and I saw some of the other people that applied one day during a blizzard we sat in the studio and played some of the audition tapes and that guy applied and I beat him wow right. that, that's pretty cool so yeah that's a good point that put me on the map in a professional sense because um the day that the station went on the air, the Wall Street Journal was there. I was on headline news. I mean, there was, and it was very nerve wracking because right. it was untouched territory. Nobody had ever done it before. And we're sitting in the studio with all this unknown equipment and, and you know, thousands of comedy albums. And, uh, and, and people are trying to interview us while we're trying to do our first show. But, you know, it got our, our names out there. Oh, he was one of the first joke jockeys. Okay, that's cool. And within a year, I was doing Morning Drive in New York City, partly because of the panache of having, you know, done, done the first all comedy station. That's oh. very cool. And it, it, was, it was awesome. I mean, nobody knows, but people like Bob Newhart and Bill Cosby had 50 or 60 comedy albums. Sure. Oh, no. Right. You know, I remember the, my dad used to have the real yeah. reels about the chicken heart that ate New York City. Oh, yeah. And yeah. Chicha Chong, yeah. too. Back oh, yeah. That's yeah. right. Chong oh, Chicha Chong ones, yeah. yeah. So before your show, you'd go into the music <laughs> yeah. library and you'd pull out a stack of albums and you, you would play them, you know. Dave's not here. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was thinking. Of. Dave, Dave's not here, man. Yeah. So, so back then, I though, you might, who who helped you out though? Who was you know like that shining light for you that helped you? Yeah, either someone you looked up to yeah. or pushed you in this direction. Well, like, most of that happened way way before then. Once I was at the comedy station, and then New York City, and then Boston, and then New Hampshire. Uh, my first, uh, the people that were kind of gave me my roots of, of creativity were mostly Detroit DJs. Really? Really. The, the, and names that nobody would know. And and when I went on to become um, a bowling telecaster, which I did for nine years, the guy who ran a show on ABC in the early 60s was also the morning man in Detroit that I listened to on the ride to school. That's so he was, like, he was like a double. His name was Fred Wolf. He was a former pro bowler, and then he hosted this weekly show that was just huge. And then he did the morning. He was hankered out of Detroit. So I got like a double barrel of inspiration from Fred Wolf. That's and then there cool. were a couple other DJs whose techniques I kind of adopted that, no, again, nobody would know. We, I just realized, though, we only got as far as New York, and then you just went Boston, yeah. New Hampshire. Yeah, so that's right. my bad. I, that's I digress. Okay. I'm like, oh, yeah. How'd you get from the All right, New so York to Washington? Boston. So we'll go back to the comedy station, which was uh, a brilliant idea. The, the guy that put it on the air, this was his lifelong dream, you know, to have all joke radio. And it was in the suburbs of Washington. It was just perfectly situated. Sadly, he had some addiction issues. We'll, we'll call it that. Mm. And uh, he just uh, he just pissed it away, sadly. So the the station, you know, he could never monetize it to the degree that it could have been. Right. And uh, our pay within a year got cut like by twenty percent. Yeah, and we weren't getting that much anyway. But it was again, to your point earlier, it kind of put me on the map. So uh, my uh, one of the other guys, one of the other DJs who came on after me, he and I kind of we would do like little five minute skits in between our shifts. And we felt that we had a good chemistry. So I said, well, why don't we just like put a little audition tape together and send it out to some consultants. Consultants service a lot of different stations instead of picking a few stations. So before you know it, we get a call from the people that are consulting the Today Show on NBC. Nice. Frank nice. Maggot Associates, and they're doing radio stations everywhere. Well, they line us up with a, uh, a station in New York City, WPIX, 
which uh, is Channel 11 in New York City, right, right on East 42nd in downtown. And before I know it, a year after the all comedy station i'm doing morning drive in new york and honestly i'll tell you the truth i wasn't really ready for it i wasn't my my chops weren't really you know i wish i could have had that chance maybe five years later because i eventually really got my act together when i worked for kurt gowdy at wcgy yep. in lawrence from 86 to 94 broadcast legend broadcast legend yeah. indeed so uh so we end up in new york city that last six months because they didn't know what to do with us oh really they, they just didn't know what my partner and i what to do with us so uh we got canned but again because of you know when you work in new york city you can call any station they'll take your call because that's the top market yeah uh and so we ended up at uh wzou which used to be wcoz in boston and we were there for about a year doing mornings um, and um, five management changes. Oh, wow. Yep. That didn't bode too well. So uh, after um, about 11 or 12, no, about 13 months, um, we read in the paper, the gossip columnist said, oh, by the way, Mike and Brad are going to be fired this morning after <gasps> their shows. Whoa. We read about it in the Norma Nathan column, which was uh, a big gossip column in the Herald back in the 80s. Wow. So we started talking about it. I mean, people are reading it. Hey, it's been great. I guess we're going to get shit canned out of here today. I didn't quite use that language, but uh, <laughs> then they would have had the cause to fire me. So at uh, 9 o'clock, the boss comes running in the studio, and he says, no, stop talking about it. You guys are not getting fired. All right, 10 o'clock an hour later. Hey, Mike, can I see you in the, <gasps> in the office? No. Yeah. And how did that go? Oh, that went really well. Oh, my God. Yeah. Really? So I was gone, but they kept my partner. <laughs> who quit in the middle of the next week because he was so upset and didn't like the guy wow. who took his place. And here's, here's a funny little side connection to Manchester, WZID. His name was Pat McKay. Oh, it's kind of a common name, the guy that came in and, and fired me. Uh, this is 1985, 86, 85. So about seven or eight years ago, I'm at WZID, and they say, oh, we're going to have a new program director, new boss come in. His name is Pat McKay. They pulled us aside one day and said, just so you know, you know, okay, big deal. I'm pretty well established at ZID. I know I'm not going anywhere like, like the ZOU incident. So I said, but I do have a problem. We need to find out if this is the Pat McKay that lied to me and then fired me an hour later. Because if it's the same guy, we need to clear the air or I'm leaving. So whoa, they got all kind of freaky about that. So what I did is I called some, some old friends that worked with me in, in Boston, and I said, we need to find out if this is the guy that came in and turned ZOU upside down. And after about two-thirds of the weekend through, somebody confirmed that it was somebody else because we couldn't find any pictures of this guy, mm -hmm. the new Pat McKay. And he turned out to be a great guy to work for. He's still there. Uh, but I was, I was really upset because I thought, okay, I, I get it. People get fired. Yeah. Not a big deal, especially in radio. But when you lie to me and then you fire me an hour later, I'm not okay with that. Yeah, yeah that, that was kind of a, that had a little slime written but all over it. But it made for a it. great story, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, and I think <laughs> it was it makes, a good story. I think it makes a good message, too, to the people yeah. that are listening is that, you know, you, you, every industry has these small circles and you never True. know, you know, the, the, who, who you're going to cross again mm -hmm. or, or how your paths are going to, you know, to cross. I know the chamber world gets smaller and smaller every year. You see these faces yeah. and these people. And it's just not good to, to burn those bridges. No, it or never that, is. Like, that's what that's one of the poorly. lessons. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, you never know when you're going to draft Tom Brady. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? To get that six-round right. draft pick. 199, yeah. baby. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. So. so you never know what oh, you have. Well, we should also, uh, we'd like to thank the New England Patriots for giving us the Super Bowl trophy, the Vince Lombardi <laughs> trophy. But we'd also like to thank our sponsors. Um so how about Enterprise Bank? Enterprise Bank, they opened their doors January 3rd, 1989, and they're dedicated to the sense of purpose that, that um, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm floundering around, but it's a podcast and it's not their my profession. Their sense of purpose is helping <laughs> yeah. small businesses like mine yeah. to get through tough economic times yeah. and be a great bankers. Yeah. They're an independent <laughs> community bank. That's really important. Yep. And. I'm telling you, they're fantastic. We have so many great people that are involved in the chamber from Enterprise Bank, and they really care about this community. But um, it's because of their team members, customers, shareholders, and citizens that they are celebrating 30 years of making a positive difference in the communities they serve. They have 24 branches in 19 communities throughout southern New Hampshire and Massachusetts with more than 
530 team members, and they have grown and grown, and they're all, but they'll always remain a genuine independent community bank, locally owned and locally managed. Their New Hampshire headquarters is located in Salem, New Hampshire at 55 Main Street. You can call them at 603-894-5631, or you can visit them at enterprisebanking.com. And where do you find that, Donna? WWW. <laughs> I haven't been saying that. <laughs> on the World that. Wide Web. They're always making fun of me. I'm like, mm-hmm. WWW, the World Wide Web. So, so I, st- I just want to talk about the relationship between you two. Right? It's true. I was told, I have it. Ri- I even wrote it down, that Mike, you DJed Donna's wedding. Like so I was going to say. I need to hear. Mike was there on my wedding day. <laughs> oh, even better. Go ahead. Say it that <laughs> and way. And invited to the honeymoon, which yeah. you know, John wasn't real happy about. <laughs> yeah, right. But, Hi, uh, John. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, when, when you're working in radio and, and you're raising a kid and you, you need to supplement your income. Again, radio is somewhat unstable, so you never know when you're going to be out the door. And I wasn't happy just, you know, getting by with paycheck. So no Enron bonuses coming your way or anything like that? Oh, or, no Enron no, bonuses. No. no, we got some okay. ratings bonuses, okay. which, which were nice when they okay. happened. Good. But uh, the reason I got to meet Donna was because I decided I would do uh, weddings on weekends. And they paid way better than any job I've I've ever had. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think back you were affordable back when we booked you. In yes. Ninety five. <laughs> so for that second wedding in your future, I mean <laughs> <laughs> You could have gone with Val Renewal. Yeah, <laughs> you okay. Went right with second wedding. <laughs> True. <laughs> Honey, I'm sorry. But I did about seven hundred weddings over, over yeah. the course of fifteen years. And as as I tell people, it, it's what put my daughter through college and bought me, you know, a reasonably nice house. And um, it was it was great. It was a lot of fun. I don't miss it because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, most years I did between eighty and ninety functions, and it was all weekend work, pretty much. Yeah. So at, by this time, you know, I'm divorced, and who's going to date somebody who's never available on the weekends? So I said, can anybody out there please get married on a Tuesday so I can have some personal time on the weekend? So my my wishes were answered about two years ago because now I'm a justice of the peace in New Hampshire. And so I can actually officiate weddings. And somebody got married on Canopy Lake, not Canopy Lake, uh, Cobbett's Pond on their boat on a Tuesday. And I said, finally... 20 years too late, but I did a Tuesday wedding. <laughs> That's right. You've done it. You've had many lives. You really have. I think that you'd be picking up people at the wedding. Oh, You're busy well, working, but you hit the thing. Like, the wedding I, crasher you, is coming yeah, in. How you well, doing? The longer... <laughs> You know, that's I'm, it's funny you'd say that because the longer There's gotta be some good stuff. I the longer I, I did those weddings, the better the mothers of the bride started to look to me. Because oh as I was beginning to age, I said, Yeah, I'm right about at the, the right age, you know, I'm I'm like fifty ish. And there's some pretty hot moms out there. That's so funny. I was thinking the thirty years of Enterprise Bank like nineteen eighty nine, I'm like, Really? <laughs> like that's only yeah. thirty years ago. Thirty like, years like no, that's like ten years ago, right? Like what? Like uh, Oh, I you're remember, just kids. Yeah, I remember blinking. So in all fairness, Mike didn't remember, but we like you moved to this area and you cro- yeah. we crossed paths with some mutual friends. It was like, you did my wedding. You don't know this, but you did. I got to go through like the old, they used to have the old Kodak uh, mm-hmm. disposable cameras. Oh, yes. So People I, put I, them I gotta, on their tables. And, I got to go yeah. through and see if I can find one of him. Nice. It's probably your mustache. We'll put it on there. Oh, yeah. We'll put it on Let's, so, uh, we've well, got you know some what? good time, so we're on, we're making good time. I, I'm still, I don't think you have hit Manchester. You're really close. You're like, you were in, you're like, <laughs> Boston. Where, where, where did we, yeah, we left in Boston yes. and then Lowell, right? No, uh, where were you? No, well, from, from Boston, um, Nashville. Uh, well, Lawrence is kind of still, I consider CGY, that Boston, yep, right? Yep. CGY. Okay. And then Kurt Gowdy, the owner, uh, finally took an offer. He'd been given offers at like every two weeks to sell the station because it was a oh. great location, but the, the signal was bad because it was in Methuen or actually in Andover, and it didn't penetrate Boston as much as it could have. We were great North Shore, north side of Boston. You couldn't hear us in Quincy. So that was a huge handicap. So the, the people that did buy it, Intercom Communications, uh, put a tower in Peabody that yeah because it's a lot of work with the FCC and all the research and all probably all the people you got to pay off to make that happen. So <laughs> so he sold it and everybody lost their jobs, which is not unusual. Even though I was told I was the only one that was going to stay and I was going to be on ninety three seven on the new whatever iteration it was going to be. But I sat with the owner's son in the the last day of the station. I said I want you to call him right now, please, and get him to commit that I because I just didn't believe it. Right. And get him to commit that I'm still going to be so Did you there. tell him the story? Like, dude, I was fired an hour later mm-hmm. after I was told I wasn't no. going to be fired. I mean, no, I, I, I don't really trust anybody when you say anything to no. me anymore. And the guy said, no, we're not keeping him. So, okay, fine. All right, so now, so now I know. 
Yeah. You, sometimes you got to push you people to tell the truth. Up in Manchester? Uh, actually, no. I decided, uh, you know, I'll take a couple months off. And they, they gave me a little bit of money to, to go away and be nice. So I was driving through Chelmsford one day and nearly rear-ended somebody um, just off of uh, 495. And it turned out to be somebody who used to do sales for our station at CGY. And she says, oh, I'm up at ZID now in Manchester, 95.7. And uh, we got a guy who was going to be on vacation for a couple of weeks. So do you want to fill in? I thought, I'm not doing anything. Why not? I mean, I went up there never with any, you know, plans or desire to, to, to work in Manchester. I thought, well, I'll just eventually move on to another market from here. So, you know, two weeks led to 20 years. Wow. <laughs> when was that? It was like 94. 94? It was 1994. Okay. Station CGY mm -hmm. went off in September. And I started doing part-time in November, so I had a couple months to just kind of chill, which is I highly recommend if you are working really hard, if you ever get canned or need a little time off, it recharges your batteries if you can afford to do it. Yep. So, uh, I'm out. Yes, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Felicia. So it, it was great. I mean, they were a really good station. I did afternoons for five years. And it's not really what I wanted to do. I told you that I wanted to do mornings. But right. they had a really successful morning show, Charlie O'Brien. And I'm not going to go and say, well, I can do better than him, even though I thought I could. Yep. But, you know, why? what do I have to show them? So I went to WHOB for two years, now Frank FM. I said, I'm going to leave. They have a morning show opening, and I'm going to take it. You know what? Because you got a good morning show here. So they weren't happy about that, but okay, that's life. Yeah. You know, if you fire me, I'm not going to be happy. So people aren't always happy. So I went there for two years, and then the morning guy, Charlie O'Brien, left in February. By April, they hadn't hired anybody. I was just kind of waiting to see if they were going to call. So I did send, uh, eventually send a note to the, the guy that's in charge of hiring. I said, you know, I'd be interested in talking to you. Within about eight minutes, I got an email back. When can you be here? So went and talked about it, negotiated, you know, a, a deal. And uh, went back to the same station I left two years earlier. So you know what I got out of this? I feel like you did 20 jobs and then 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You were all over the place. Well, you just yeah. seemed very persistent to get yeah. exactly what, I mean, it took you, yeah. it took you a long, a long time to get what you want. And True. you were, you were persistent throughout the whole mm -hmm. thing. And, you know, a lot of people wouldn't spend 20 years trying to, trying to accomplish something in business. And then there are other people that spend 40 years doing the same exact thing. So I think sure. your persistence is one of your biggest characteristics. Well, yeah, Number I, one, you were like, listen, this yeah. is the job I want. This is what I want to do. And you stuck with it. And it obviously was what you wanted because you ended up staying there for 20 years. You got your morning show in a fabulous state, just saying, mm -hmm. with fabulous people. Yeah, it is a wicked great. Wicked awesome people. Yeah. I mean, it really is. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, you, you, you've been all over the, you've been all over the world. You've, you've been on radio all, all over the country and you, you see the difference. I mean, you come yep. here, it's a very, it's very different. You know, it's a very different society. I think Salem and, and the southern New Hampshire area is really a different, it's a different place, you know. Yeah, that's why I decided to, to stay. You know, I mean, came to New England in 84, and I just did the math the other day. I have now spent a little over half my life in New England. You know, my family's back in Michigan, but now I have so many friends, and my daughter lives in Boston, so, I mean, there's another good reason to, to stay. So, you know, this is where they're going to you know, You're very proud of your daughter too. I read I read some stuff about <laughs> your you know your your one of your proudest moments was her graduating from she Suffolk University. Uh, Leslie Leslie University. Yes, yes, and just as good of school. And um, you know, what's known for pretty... teaching is your teacher. Or? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, she's she's not. She ended up being a uh, a social worker well, and, 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 and in psychology. Yeah, yeah but yeah, now she school. just. Just took a new job after working for uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for 13 years. She's going into private industry, working for a company. In fact, she starts uh, in March at a place called Vertex, which is right on the Boston Harbor. And they are the leaders in research for cystic fibrosis, finding wow. a cure. And I've been working with them for the last probably 10 or 12 years doing an annual fundraiser. And I was very well at this company. I said, do you realize what a great company you're going to work for? And so she's really excited and very proud of it. How did you get involved in that? In uh, when, you, when you do radio, you get a lot of requests to come sure. and host fundraisers, which I love doing because it's a way to give back to the community. Um, you know, because, you know, I don't do anything. I don't work in soup kitchens. I, I don't do anything. But I figure I have a talent that, that can help people raise money. Yep. And so I was doing probably 30 of those a year for free. Uh, because I just felt, you know, this is great. It's a great community effort. I get to meet a lot of people. They appreciate it. You it's the one way you money. can help people give by giving back. Absolutely. Like you said, you know. So uh, I really enjoy doing that. And I, I do less of it now. 
And in all fairness, I, I do charge now for a lot of those events because I don't have income Mike's for the most eat. part. Right. Mike's got to eat. <laughs> and even though I still have some you know minimal income coming in, but I also have a lot to offer. I help people that have not done events before, sure. help them kind of avoid a lot of the mistakes that are going to happen, a lot of the bumps in the road. And because I've done so many of them, I can, I can read the room. I can tell you this isn't going to work. The dinner needs to be moved up 15 minutes or, or whatever. Right. And so I, I'd say besides getting a host, you're going to get a consultant on how to make this a better yeah. guest experience. Well, I've been to several things and you've done mm-hmm. things with the chamber. Yeah, you're, you're a professional. So, you know, you can say, oh, we're going to earn yeah. money. But if you just right. make that small investment, you'll have right. a better overall event and I then it so. makes more in the long run. And I, and I love the events that I've done with the chamber. Which, of course I mean, he has. You, uh, you, <laughs> you, you have, you have a, a good handle on on flow and what, what people want. And, and so I love it's easy friend. for me to say yes. <laughs> so you were talking about your daughter's career change. What about you, right? We're talking, we got, yes. we're, we're, you're, we could talk for an hour, but I don't know if everyone will listen for an hour. Is there anybody You've left? Got, you got this great stuff. <laughs> Ed's still here. Yeah. So yeah. you switch from radio to tell us about your being an author. You're, you're a communications guy. I'm a communications guy. And uh, I guess why I really liked radio is because it was all about storytelling. I did, radio shows that would have people call in and tell little 20 second stories or whatever because I always believe that everybody has a story to tell you just have to kind of get them to you draw it out of them that's what we're doing yeah, yeah and you know I'm so shy and quiet you've been able to get me to talk yeah, so I, much I, I haven't shut up I think I, I said three things <laughs> <laughs> so I thought okay so how can I kind of do this type of work without being on the radio. And so I decided writing and podcasting would be, you know, for me. I did uh, about a year and a half worth of uh, podcast about people that change their careers, but I, I wasn't that interested in monetizing it. And I said, all right, I have to put my efforts into other areas. So I decided to do books. And I, I'm a columnist for the National Telegraph. I've done about 500 columns for them. Uh, the February issue of New Hampshire Magazine has an eight-page feature that I wrote. So that's where I'm putting oh. my energy. I did the Fifty Shades of Radio book because I thought, man, I got so many stories of my own. Let's see if I can put them into a book and then go out and, and tell stories. And you've both heard me speak, and you know that kind of what we're doing here now is what I do in front of people, which is a lot of fun. Uh, and then I, I was a bowling host on TV on Candlepin's uh, Stars and Strikes on Channel 50, and then WLVI, Candlepin's for Dollars. So after nine years, and being a bowler myself, I thought, why hasn't anybody done a story of the behind the scenes? Because when Channel 5 ran the show for 40 years, they had over 200,000 people watching it. That's amazing, isn't every it? Every week. I think about it. I was one of those kids. Yeah. I, was, I loved it. Loved it, loved it, it's loved it. It's mind-blowing. The, the yeah. people that were on that show, the ones that were successful were on so often, they became bigger stars and more recognizable than Larry Bird or Carl Yastrzemski, which is hard to imagine, yeah. but I'm not lying to you when I see these people sign autographs. So I thought, let's get their story because I love getting people's stories. That's cool. So that led to Lunch nice. with Tommy and Stacia, uh, which is TV's Golden Age of Candlepin Bowling, uh, which just uh, came out February 21st. So, which is today, by the way. Just today, as, as we record. Yes. Oh uh, this is our 16th podcast, so I think it's a oh. sweet 16. So oh, this is nice. very nice. Yes. So. I think we need to, to mention to folks out there that... Um, he could hold his camera up to, uh, oh, right up up to the right. camera. You can see oh. the... Here, let me move to Sean. I think we need to mention to folks, because I moved here in 1979 from Nebraska, and I, the TV had these people bowling, (laughs) and I'm like, what are they doing? That's not a bowling ball. Yeah, turn, yeah, show them the the bowling pin. There there was these these pins, if anyone's from Mm non-New England out there listening, it's called candle pin, and it's not the typical weighted bottom. I was like, what Mm -hmm. is this? I I was, you know, 10 years old looking at this That's exactly how I felt. Oh, yeah, I, that's right. That's, You're not I, I'm from Michigan, which is one of the top bowling, you know, 10-pin bowling areas in the country. I was a very avid bowler. I was pretty good. I enjoyed it a lot. So I moved here when I uh, came to do the job interview at WZOU in August of 84. We're at the Royal Sinesta Hotel in Cambridge, you know, with, with my then wife and my Liz was four at the time. And I turn on the TV. It's like noontime. And I'm watching this and I'm going... What is this? <laughs> Candleton bowling? It's not bowling. No, it's not bowling, but it looks like fun. Yeah. So I moved into Maynard uh, when I started WZOU. It's a drive in every morning from the suburbs in an area I could afford at that time. And I wanted to join a bowling league. But the closest 
10 pin bowling center was i think in chelmsford at the time right. and getting up at three in the morning i didn't feel like doing that night league thing and then driving mm -hmm. home so i thought you know what there's a little candlepin place in acton and you know i'm not going to get any better at 10 pin so why don't i try this so I did, and I liked it, and I started talking about it on the radio, kind of goofing on it, which probably wasn't the smartest thing to do. <laughs> the irony now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm asking people to pay now for these stories that I made fun of. And so the guy that owned the bowling center took him a couple of weeks to, to ferret me out and find out, who is this guy that's talking about my bowling alley on TV, on, on the radio, on this big station? And so eventually I got to know the family, became very good friends. Uh, his wife, Sharon... Uh, became a president of the International Cantaloupe and Bowling Association and drafted me into doing some public relations work for them and to help them. And so I got all the insight because I sat in on board meetings and I listened to what bowling center owners really want to do to raise scores and all this other stuff. And before long, I'm asked to host a TV show on WNDS that I did for eight years. And the funny thing is, when they hired me, I don't think they had any idea that I knew bowling. I think they just knew me from the radio. I cut a lot of their commercials, voiceover at Channel 50. I'd go yeah. in, and I think they said, oh, yeah, Mike Moore, and people know him. Let's, let's see if he wants to, to do the show. They, I, I'm convinced to this day they had no idea. They just hired, they wanted a body that, That's you know, funny. that people knew. So... Well, yeah, they were like, well, he's from right Detroit. In. What the hell would he yeah. possibly know about Kendall and bowling? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so that went for eight years. Then after several ownership changes, most of them from out of town had no appreciation for the culture of Candlepin bowling. I get that. Donna, you and I, we came into town. We got, this is weird. But if you stick around long enough, you know that people absolutely love it. And they embrace it because nobody else in the world has it except New England and the Canadian Maritimes. Well, right. I think that when, another good point is, again, I was, I was a kid, like this is weird, but mm -hmm. I fell in love with it because when I, in high school, we'd go over to Exeter and the, oh, right. the bowling alley. Yeah. And the balls are smaller too. So it all of a sudden, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, when you're little, when you're a little kid and you go bowling, it's hard. They go and much faster into the gutter than yeah, these big yeah. ones do. <laughs> I, so, <laughs> right. Yeah, into the gutter. That's yeah. yeah. me. I'm like, <laughs> pew. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's very accessible to, yes. you know, Older people, young people. It, it, I mean, That's a big selling point. Yeah, is you know? And now they have these gutter bumpers that they can put up, so the, the ball kind of goes back and forth. If the kid throws it, he doesn't get discouraged because, you know. Glow bowling. I mean, there's bowling, so many yeah. things that have come hey, out of it. Yeah. Craig and I might want those bumpers up, too. Oh, God. I, I have to play with those all day because it's just so frustrating. Because you think you're throwing it straight, and you're like, yeah, yeah. no, I'm just not mm -hmm. even close. So. So. Yeah, exactly. It is. It's a neat New England thing. It's I such a great culture, too, and it's such a – there's so many kids that could tell you, listen, I watched the Three Stooges in the morning, mm -hmm. we watched Candle Pins for Cash, or we watched Bowling for Dollars, and then we watched the Creature, Creature Double, Double Feature, Feature afterwards. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I thought you were say that. There's a book right there. Creature yeah. Double the culture of that. Yeah, that, <laughs> Saturday, love that, Saturday, that Saturday with, the, with yeah. the Three Stooges all the time. And Creature yeah. Double Feature, yeah. black and white. Yeah, but people yeah. love nostalgia. Channel 56. That's why yeah, I've WLVI. decided that my, my books going forward are going to be nostalgia based because today's world has gotten really you know mean and nasty but yeah. so people like a little break from that and the next book that i just started research on a few months ago is the 100 year history of the red arrow diner in manchester you talk about stories yeah. uh, i went down to connecticut to uh, interview the son of the founder of the red arrow diner and it was one of the most amazing experiences uh, first of all the guy lives in a mansion and it has nothing to do with Red Arrow money that his dad, you know, amassed or whatever. It has to do with the fact that he became a lawyer, but not a practicing lawyer. He eventually met, through the Peace Corps, the Rockefeller family. And they took him in as their attorney to uh, help with their philanthropic endeavors. Which the rest, were many. The rest is history. Yes. And boy, did he have some guys in his 80s, and he's, he's, he's still totally there. And he gave me some great stories. Would he like to sponsor success? In the I, I think we should get him on, <laughs> too. I think he'd name, be a great story. His name of a famous rock star, Ray LaMontagne. Nice. Oh, that's cool. So um, that that's just one little snippet of unexpected things that I'm going to find while I write this book. So we, we, we just just for the people that might not know, the Red Arrow Diner is a tiny little place in Manchester. It's so cool. But what, what it's known for is basically every, you know, it capitalizes on the, the political um, first in the nation that New Hampshire mm -hmm. possesses. Yeah, every four years. So, I mean, they yeah. say Red Arrow Diner. Oh, it's a diner. No, no, mm -hmm. it's an everyone stops there and they have, you tell us a little bit about the place. It's yeah. so cool. It's, it's very tiny, but they've also expanded. They've got yeah, one in, in London, London area, area, as you know, at Exit 5. They've got one in Milford just off the circle. 
and the latest one is in Concord. So they've decided to expand a little bit. But the real heart and soul is the little joint on Lowell Street that, you know, it's almost like a phone booth. Right. But all the regulars hang out there. And as you mentioned, every square inch of the wall is covered with newspaper articles. Adam Sandler is a regular there right. when he's mm -hmm. in town. In fact, there's a, a plate that's named after his dad, Stan Sandler, that is in there. And uh, it's, it's amazing. So once I get past, like, all the people that helped found it, then I'm going to drill down and get to the stories. And next February, if, if that's when the primary turns out to be in new hampshire i'll be there every waking moment getting Very every cool. story i can so cool. there's going to be a multi-layer uh book and their their anniversary is 2022 so I, my goal is to get it out in 2021 because there's always little things along the way that slows down publication well i'll tell you you gotta start now because there's like <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> i would like to say i'm not running for president <laughs> because apparently everyone well, else you are is. a president aren't you <laughs> that's right what do i need yeah. to you're already a president that's so right. it's too late well i say i'm a presidonna <laughs> I, like I like that i like it too so i think we got to have you back mike this yeah has been i think i want to hear more about the red hour too i think it, you know we do ch need to keep in touch because you've got some great you've got some great stories i'd i'd actually love to hear really quick before we sign off mm -hmm. a, a story about in your first book because you you, you went through it really quick um, in our rotary meeting a few weeks ago, and that's yes. where you and I first met. And they cut me down to about nine seconds. Yeah. You, you, got, I, you, <laughs> you got your one-hour presentation. You're like, you've yeah. got seven and a half minutes. Yeah. But that, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I, love, I love talking to rotaries because everybody is so attentive, and it's the right age of people that, that love radio the way it used to be. Right. And, and I have so many of those stories. Do you have a particular one in mind? No. No, just share one with us because there were just some great ones that you just – yeah, and if there's a quote in there, we'll take it. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get to his quote. <laughs> All right. So uh, one of my uh, favorite stories is uh, when I was 25 years old, I was working in Toledo, and I was four years into my career. I was doing afternoons, and it was a time when you could talk a lot more with listeners when they would give you a phone call and ask for a song. And I became friendly with, uh, and not on purpose, but she called a lot, a woman who was probably 70 years old at the time. She lived in subsidized housing across the other side of town, $40 a month. I mean, this remember, this is 45 years ago. And um, as, a, as a really young guy, I didn't really know how to politely excuse myself. So I got drawn into her life to some degree to the point where she would take the bus into downtown Toledo and she would bring me things. She brought me a mood ring as, as one example. We all remember mood rings. Well, you were much too young, Donna, but yeah. I'm sure Craig I remembers. Were, were all I remember. <laughs> yeah. So it, it was a ring that, based on, the, on how warm or cold your hand was, the, the colors would change. Right. It, was a, yeah. like, it was the pet rock of the mid-70s. Right. <laughs> then she brings down a winter coat. Now, remember, here's a woman that, that is uh, you know, very poor. Right. Well, she's on a she's, fixed income. And, yeah. Right. She sends me cards in the mail with a $5 bill. Like your grandma used to do. Like so, she, my grandmother would do that to me when I was a Duquesne in Pittsburgh. Oh, really? Like Ten dollars. I'm like, guys, like ten bucks. You know how much wow. crappy that's beer case, you can buy for ten dollars? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Some Allegheny beer. <laughs> so, you know, eventually, you know, she kept weaving her way in, into my life, and and I didn't know how to say, you know, we, we got to back off a little. Just maybe call me once a week, and not every day or whatever. So the the. I guess the the draw the straw that broke the camel's back was uh, she sends me an envelope one day. It's a Manila, eight and a half by eleven or whatever, and I open it up and it's a full black and white nude photo of herself, Whoa. not as a younger woman, but as she currently was at at about seventy years of age. Wow. And I just thought, well, this this Your grandma didn't do that. No, no, yeah. my, no, not to any of my friends either. So, yeah. <laughs> so I finally had to say, well. We, we can't There's do this anymore. been a miscommunication Yeah, a here. little miscommunication. You, you <laughs> totally misread me. Yes, I like cougars, but not, you know. Oh. Wow. So anyway. I mean, but, it, uh, a sweet lady, you get a lot of stories like that. Though. Oh, I mean, you get a lot boy, of people that are, you know, because yeah. they love the, they, people love to glom too, right? You get yeah. those glomers who. Yeah. I'm just glad she didn't have a cell phone. <laughs> oh, yeah. No kidding. I'd, I'd still be getting photos of yeah, her from, the, from the grave because, I mean, she'd be 115 now if she were still alive. Aww. But but you know what? That means that you uh, you connect with people. So I was, we'll spin a positive on that. All right. You're I like nice that. and you're connecting with people. It's a very good so. observation. Yeah. And that's what oh, you have to do. That might be our cue. <laughs> Yeah, we're done, I guess. Was that the whistle where everybody at two guys yeah, goes Everybody home? leaves home. Yeah, they have Or is that horn. the smoke alarm? <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of uh speaking of loud noises, let's mm -hmm. talk about let's talk about um 
We talked about a quote earlier before the show, okay. and, and I, I knew what your quote was going to be because yes. I kind of stalked you a little bit myself yeah. all, while I was no nude pictures coming your way, Mike. So, um, but you look good for seventy. Thank you. Craig, I appreciate let me just it. Say that. Yeah, <laughs> I hope I do look good at seventy. <laughs> yeah. I hope I'm here to look good yeah, right. at seventy. I'll be happy with that. Yeah. But not stalking anybody either yeah. at seventy. So what? Um, we have a company that sponsors our, our quotes called Santo Insurance. Jamie Santo is a, a good friend of mine, known him for many years. Mm-hmm. Um, Donna's going to read a little bit about him, but yeah, we, I want we'll to hear a quote that inspires you every day. Okay. So, all right. Sure. All right, Donnie, go. Oh, oh are you going to read first? Well, yeah. Right. Well, see, quote of the week, insurance quote. Yeah. Oh, oh, but I'm okay. Love see, it. I hate when you have to Take highlight the jokes. <laughs> <you know? Right. laughs> Tip your servers. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Santo Insurance and Financial Services operates under the independent agency model. This allows them to search the entire marketplace to find the best coverages and premiums for their clients. With today's busy lives and businesses, one size may not fit all. Santo Insurance has the flexibility to move carriers that best suit their clients' needs. They carefully review each of their carrier's product to get their clients the best solutions. They're located at 224 Main Street in Salem, New Hampshire, and they have been in business for over 25 years. Call them at 603-890-6439 or visit them on the World Wide Web. Mind mind if I call them right now? SantoInsurance.com. So I'll text you. him for you. He'll, he'll I got a quote for you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's hear it, Mike. Mike, all right, the, so, your, your inspirational quote. All right, so it's, it's my father. Uh, my dad was just a very laid back guy, but a very successful um, sales engineer. And because he was good at sales, he knew how to deal with people. And so he would always say to me, you know, whenever you get upset with somebody or wanted to tell him off, just remember, Mike, you get a lot more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Although I suspect he used another word that related to a, a bodily function. <laughs> but I, I think about that often that, yeah, if, if you're nice to people, you can pretty much get them to do what you want Including as opposed to really burn you. those bridges. <laughs> Including what? <laughs> Including sending you. <laughs> yes. If you're very nice to people, they'll yeah. send you pictures of themselves. Yeah. No, so, I think that's so sage advice. You're you're super it is. I mean, it's, it's yeah, something absolutely. you hear all the time. It's not out of the ordinary, no. but it, in my life, it's been words to live by. Yeah, it's, it's a golden it's, rule. It's, it's a golden rule type of thing. Yeah. You know, you're teaching, you're, mm-hmm. you want people to treat you the same way you want to be treated. And yeah. they get a... I've just had so much fun. I could keep talking. I know I that know. we. I know that we're I under the it. gun for for time, but um, so our next book's going to be about the Red Hour Diner. Yes. This book yes. is Lunch with Tony and Stacia. Stacia. Uh, uh, Tommy and Stacia. Tommy, Tommy and Stacia. Yes, they were the they were the two big stars. Yes, um, she was she was an amazing uh, athlete. I mean, yeah. and there's a great story in here about when she got drafted into playing a softball game. She was 65 years old. And uh, they, the, the, she was watching a game. It was all younger women, but they were going to forfeit because they didn't have enough women on the field. So they, you know, Stacia volunteered to come down. Again, she's in her 60s, and they put her where they don't think she can do any damage. So, uh, uh, you know, they, they just said, when you get up the bat, just don't even do anything. Just maybe you'll get hit or you'll walk or whatever. So she swings away and hits a single. Nice. And, and, and then she, she was really upset because somebody cut her off when she was going to make a catch in the outfield that she feels cost them the game because then they went and ended up scoring about eight or nine runs. And she said, I could easily have caught that and we would not have lost. She was very competitive, very athletic. And that story was in Sports Illustrated wow. about Stacia Zernike, and it's in the book too. Great. Well, now where can we get this book? The book is... Uh, in about a week, around the 1st of March, we'll be on Amazon. But if you go that route, you don't get a signed copy. Okay. Uh, and uh, actually, if you go to MikeMoreInMedia.com, I've got a calendar. I've got all kinds of appearances. Uh, this weekend, which is the last weekend in February, I'll be doing signings at bowling centers. And why wouldn't I want to go to bowling centers and sell the book? Right. Because Absolutely. I just went live today, uh, hours before we – I almost didn't make it here because I, I was just blown away by all the people wanting to send money or where are you going to be? I want three copies, put them aside here awesome. and there. So, well, they could, you know, we've got plenty of room in the studio, Mike. They could have yeah. came down here, you know, and we could have signed copies. <laughs> well, if you'd have given me uh, just a little more notice. Well, actually, I didn't, <laughs> pick, I didn't pick up the book in all no, fairness. No, we knew. To you. Yeah, we knew that yeah, when right. we talked a couple of weeks ago, we knew yeah. it was going to be right around that Sounds time like frame. Sounds like we so. need a chamber pit. A uh, chamber event with you at Park Place Lanes, and uh, well, that would not be a bad idea. I do know the owner there. Yeah, yeah. that would be great. We'll that's a great spot. I mean, that's been mm-hmm. around for God, yeah. how many years at has least that been? Over, yeah. over thirty. Uh, but the, but the reason, one Nelson of the reasons this book is doing well because nobody has ever bothered to look into the history and tell the story. Right. There was one book in 1980 that came out uh, that really became sort of the Bible, but it wasn't 
professionally done. It was, but it was the book. And so now, because I'm a professional writer, I know how to organize you know, content. And so people are just, oh, I must have Candlepin book because there are no, and, and there's no TV shows anymore. Yeah. So people are jonesing for all things Candlepin. Jonesing, so I love it. You got to find the, you got to find the <laughs> hole and fill it. Yeah. Mike Morin, thank you so much My for being pleasure. here. Thanks for being you here. You guys are great hosts. Thanks for Thanks. having me. I appreciate yeah. it. And, and Donna's going to tell you one more thing yeah, about you. Yeah, this is our tagline. Been. Thanks for being here. You've been wicked awesome company. Wicked awesome. Thank Wicked you. awesome. Wicked. Buy the book. Mike Morin. Yep. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.